Let's now have a look at doing some manual text animation. So I'm going to go back to the project, down to new composition. And once again, it's remembered the composition settings, which is perfect. That's what we want. Uh, I'm going to call this composition um, three, two, one. We're going to do a little countdown. We'll hit OK and we'll go and grab our type tool. I'm going to click somewhere in the middle and type the number three. And maybe I want it a more interesting color and a different font. So I'm just going to select across it and I'll whack it up. I'm going to make it quite large this time so it's easy to see. And feel free, as mentioned before, to go and pick different font. If you've got other fonts installed on here, then you can go ahead and pick whichever fonts you've got installed. I'm just going to use a very simple font called Arial, which most of us should have. I'm going to go and make it bold. And um, I'm going to go and make it a kind of pink color. There you go. If I wanted to this time add a stroke to it, uh, the stroke color is the um, second box. And if you click on it, it comes to the foreground. It has a red line, which means it's currently not using a stroke. If I click on it and then go and set a color, maybe I'll go for a kind of medium gray again. Now I've got a stroke on there. It's very hard to see because it's so thin. So the stroke width is controlled here. You can increase the stroke width by a number of pixels. Uh, and you can choose how the stroke interacts with the actual um, text. So in this case, the stroke is going over the fill color, um, which is slightly distorting it. So I'm going to say all oh, the fill be on the top. So if the fill is on the top, then I'm only seeing the stroke being added outside of that. OK, I'll just give that a little, little bit of a stroke out there. OK, there's my text. Uh, another way to center things up is in the window menu, we have align tools. If I go to the align tool, I can say, oh, align this layer to the left or align it to the right or to the center, vertical center or the horizontal, horizontal center. So I'm going to pop it uh, there. I actually want the anchor point to be um, at the bottom center this time because we're going to scale it a little bit and it might look strange scaling from there. So I'll go to paragraph. I'm going to go to center text and then I'm going to align again, center and center. OK, so that's now my text is centered. So we're going to have the text just slide in and bounce a little bit and stop there and then disappear and then two and then one. So this is our first letter. What's helpful with text layers is whatever you type in the text becomes the name of the layer. So this is layer three. It's got the number three in it. So let's start by bringing this text all the way off to the left. So it's not in shot. So I'm going to select this. I'm going to open up the transform and I'm just going to move this all the way across. Now, when it goes out of the composition, it's quite handy because you get this wire bounty box around it, this little frame, which shows us where the text uh, layer is, or it would be the same with any layer. So that's nice and handy. So I want to now drop a keyframe for position. And then I'm going to go along to, I want it to come in about half a second. So half a second is about 12 frames. So I'm going to bring it up to frame 12. Remember, you can use page up and page down, command left and right arrow key to do that. We can just drag it along so you see till you see 12. Now I want it to be in the center. Now I've already dropped my keyframe at the beginning. So if I move it, it'll drop another keyframe. Well, to get it back in the center, I'm just going to use the align uh, center button there. So now there we go. It's moved it there. I can see the motion path. I can scrub through and see there's number three. Now, if I play this back, it's very linear movement, but also it's just straight 
and it's not particularly interesting. And usually with animation, it's more interesting to exaggerate things. Um, or in this case, we want to create something known as overshoot. So I want the number to go too far and then bounce back. So actually, um, although it's taking half a second to get to its final destination, I'm going to go back a few frames. I'm going to go back to say frame eight. So it's say two thirds through the motion. And here, I'm actually going to just move it even further. I can see that's the end frame there. I'm actually going to just move it so it overshoots that a little bit. And so now I've dropped a third frame. So it's going from A to B via here. So if I bring the work area down, let's just focus this down to just a few frames, maybe 25 frames for the time being. Zoom in. If I play that back, now I've got this little bounce. It's kind of hitting an invisible wall there. And that just makes it a lot more interesting. Now, because the first frame is not in shot, there's not really any value of me having it as an easy, easy key frame. And because the second frame here, I want it bouncing, like we had the bouncing ball, I don't want that to be easy, easy. I don't want it to cushion down. But this last frame here, from it's suddenly stopping, I'll just have it easy, easy. It's quite fast, so it will be very subtle. We might no not notice it too much, but I'll right click on the third keyframe, keyframe assistant, easy, easy. And now, Play that back. That's just sliding in and stopping a little bit nicer. So that's my first number appearing. It doesn't need to stay on screen very long because a single character can be read very, very quickly. So I'll probably I'll go to frame 20 and I want to start getting rid of it. So at frame 20, I'm not going to move its position. Sometimes it's more interesting to have something appear one way and disappear another way. So I'm going to go to scale this time. I'm going to click on the scale stopwatch. And then I'll go along maybe five frames. So I'm at frame 20. Again, it doesn't matter exactly. You have to be exactly the same frame numbers I am. Play around with the frames. You'll get a sense of how the timing works. The larger number of frames, the slower the movement. The closer the frames are, the faster. So I'm going to go five frames to frame 25. And eventually I want the number three to just disappear so it's scaled down to zero. But before it does that, I want it to scale up. So I'm going to say maybe scale up to, or let me go up to say 120%. So it's going to get bigger. And then I'll go another five frames, one, two, three, four, five. And then I'll have it come down to zero. Now, when you've got general scale control like here, if I scale it, if I drag it down, look what happens when it gets down to zero. Ooh, it goes to minus, and then it's kind of flipping it on the horizontal and vertical axis. So it's now upside down. That can be useful if you want to flip something or mirror it. In this case, I want it to be zero. So I just type in zero, hit return, and now that's disappeared. If I now run that through, it's going to get larger and then it's going to get smaller and disappear. Let's bring the work area out a little bit further out to frame 50 now. If I play that back, three slides in and then it scales up and down. Now working with easy ease keyframes on position, as we've done several times now, we want to be selective. Some frames we may want to be linear, some frames we want to be easy ease. Generally with scale keyframes and rotation keyframes, generally they nearly always look better easy ease. So I'm just going to take all those scaled keyframes, right mouse button click, go down to the keyframe assistant and easy ease. You can see the shortcut for there. So now play that back, scales up and down, so it slides in, scales up and down and off. So that's the first number done. Now before I do the second number, I'm not going to see three again. So there's no point in the layer having all this duration. In fact, if I just Strim that down for a second and zoom out, you can see this layer is going on for 250 frames. Well, I don't see it after frame 30. So what you can do is if you go to the end of the layer, you can trim it down. Now, if you select a layer and click and, and move it left and right, you're moving it in time. I don't want to do that. If I do that, look at the keyframes, it moves the keyframes with it. But if I go at the end of the layer, uh, so I can see this 
trim tool, I can trim it down. And I'm going to trim it down to, it doesn't need to be any more than frame 30. That's basically the layer switching off. If it switched off earlier than there, you can see it would just suddenly disappear. So you can use that if you want the layer to just switch on and switch off at certain points of time. But in this case, I'll keep it on. I'll have it scale so it disappears. And this just visually makes it easier in After Effects. We'll see this when we've got a few layers in a moment. We can see, ah, the number three only is only actually visible in our comp at this moment of time. So it's just a little bit easier to see. So that's a good start. What we want to do now is duplicate it. So I'm going to take the layer and of course you can go up and edit, copy and edit, paste, but After Effects has, a, has its own option to duplicate, which is really useful. You can duplicate layers, you can duplicate comps, you can duplicate um, lots of different things just using the duplicate button or the shortcut command or control D, very useful. I'm going to duplicate it. Now, interestingly enough, when you have a layer that has a name and a number at the end of the name, it incrementally names it. So this was called layer three. So it's just, a, oh, I'm going to call this one layer four. Well, actually it's still three. In fact, the two layers are completely identical at the moment. If you bring it through to say frame 20, um, these two layers are identical. If I double click on this one, I'm now going to change it to two. So if you press two, now it's two, it's not identical. It's the same color, the same stroke, the same timing, but it's a different character and that's renamed it there. So that's two, but I don't want two to start at the same time. I want it to be offset. I want to move it back. I'm not sure how far back I want to move it. I might want to move it um, 15 or 20 frames, something like that. So just go ahead this time and select the layer. So not trim it, but this time select the layer and move it back so it starts later. And now if you play back, you have your first number and then your second number. And just keep sliding it around until you get the kind of offset you think works best. I'm trying mine about starting at 18 frames that seems to work a bit better three two three two okay that's working now even while it's playing back i can double click on this layer which is selecting the layer and i can go up to the fill color of that layer click on it select it and then i could say oh i want this to be a different color okay so it's even previewing it I've got preview on it's previewing it while it's animating it again slightly may depend on your um, system how well that that copes but now I've got Three, two, I've not had to do all the animation again. I've just duplicated the layer. When you duplicate a layer, it duplicates the effects, it duplicates the timings, it duplicates any properties you put on there like masks. So in the case of the text layer now, I've just had to rename it and change its color and offset it. So if you've got that done, have one more go at that. Select the layer that's called two, and I'll press Command D or Control D on the PC to duplicate that again. And provided you could see that layer, don't do it when it's off screen, it'd be a bit harder. Provided you could see that layer, then double click on it, type one, and then most likely you're going to want to change its color again and offset it again. My previous one I'd offset 18 frames, so I want to offset this another 18 frames. You can sometimes add in numbers here as well to make your life a little bit easier. Sorry, 18. I can go up to 36, take me over there and Move this to start at 36. Oops. 
three, two, one. Three, two, one. Okay, now, of course, if we want to add motion blur to this, we can do that. Sometimes, depends, uh, this is a stylistic choice. Sometimes people prefer text not to have motion blur because they want it to look very crisp and graphic. But if you want to see what would this look like with motion blur on, even while it's playing back, I can go click, 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 enable motion blur on all those layers. Now you can see this definite smooth blur to it as it swipes in and it's also going to be scaling doing a blur on the scale so in this case because it's scaling from the anchor point down here most scale movements happening at the top so that's making the whole animation a lot smoother Okay, looking good. So let's go and add a background. Again, this is coming through onto a black background or transparent. Um, if I were to export this as a normal video file, it would just export with a black background. If I were to export it as an image file that contains an alpha channel transparency information, it would retain that transparency information. Then if I bring it into some uh, other editing application then these numbers would appear on a transparent background and that's very useful if you're doing things like lower thirds or titles that are supposed to go over video if you're making elements that you want um, to be used in an edit then um, then that's valid in this case i want to put it onto a different background i want to put it onto an image so uh, let's go up to file import file and let's go into a stills folder into textures. I've got a couple of different textures in here. Let's go and use this one blackboard and open that. That comes in here and I take the blackboard image and I'm just going to drag it beneath the other layers. So there we've got our letter or our number, sorry, appearing on the blackboard. Of course, we can try out a whole variety of different backgrounds, but I just wanted to show you that's us integrating uh, graphics into a photographic background. Uh, I think I want to tweak it a little bit. So what am I going to do? Probably a bit of blur on the background and then probably a bit of drop shadow on the text. So let's go back over to our effects and presets. I've got a few tabs open now. If you can't see all of them, Go to the little chevrons and that will give you a list. So back to effects and presets. I want to grab that blur. Do you remember G-A-U-S? Grab Gaussian blur. Pop that onto the background. That appears in the effects controls and you can come and just pump up that amount of blur. Just a little bit subtle on there. It's looking good. Now let's go back to the first number we've got there, number three. Um, kind of getting lost a bit because of the gray edge. So I want to use my drop shadow. So back into the and presets, drop. You can see it there or you can type in space S to so narrow it down. And I want to put this onto the number three. If I'm careful, you see it I looks like it's found three, but again, be careful because you might think it's on the right layer and it might put it on another layer that's in the same place. If I drop it on there, I can see, ah, yes, that's working. I'll increase normally the distance first. We see what we've got and then feel free to play with the direction, the softness, the angle. If you want to have a crisp or a diffuse shadow on there, stronger or more subtle. Okay, now that drop shadow is on the layer and you can see it's also taking the animation on it. So the text layer, you can see the effect happens prior to the animation. So wherever the layer moves, the drop shadow moves with it, that's handy. Now, because I've customized the drop shadow here, if I go to layer two and start again, I'm gonna to have to use the same settings and again with layer one. So much easier if I select layer three 
and go to drop shadow. If I select it up here, I can go to copy. What that's going to do is it's going to copy not just the effect, but the settings that are in the effect. And now if I go perhaps to my second layer, select layer two and just go edit, paste. It's pasting just the drop shadow with those exact settings onto layer two and layer number one, edit, paste again. Once again, it's pasted the exact settings. Now, if I wanted to, I could customize them and say, oh, actually by here, I'll, I'll make the shadow a little bit paler. Um, so that it's very customizable, they're not linked, but that just makes it easier. If I just, if I set up an effect setting, I can just copy and paste it onto all the layers very, very easily. Okay, and uh, we had a look at the vignette effect earlier on the solid layer. I can use all these effects on generated layers like solids and shapes and text, but I can also use them on still images and footage. So if I type in here and type in VIG, grab my vignette, if I drag it onto my blackboard image, then I just add a little bit of a darkened vignette on there, just kind of increase that a bit. So there we've got a number counter. Our text is animating three, two, one. We've got a photographic background in there. We've used our motion blur. We've got our drop shadow in there and our vignette on there. Uh, that again should be playing pretty decent back on your machine. But again, if you've got an older machine, it's struggling a bit, you can just turn off the uh, motion blur effect to speed that all up. That's using keyframes on text layers, combining them with uh, backgrounds and being able to duplicate elements like the layers makes it much easier. So we don't have to do all the work again, being able to copy and paste effect settings uh, and keyframes just makes working uh, in After Effects so much faster. So that's having a look at shape layers and text layers and solid layers.